Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lukes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. In this video lesson, we're going to be looking at chapter six of the Turton Process Design textbook. This chapter is entitled Understanding Process Conditions. And really we wanna emphasize what typical ranges for temperature and pressure need to be. And if you are not going to be in those typical ranges, you need to justify that. Because as the author said, the ability to make an economic analysis of a chemical process based on the PFD isn't pro proof that the process will actually work. So we want to start preparing ourselves to determine how we can make it work and be economical. So there are some basic heuristics for temperature and pressure. And basically, if I need to go to a temperature for cooling that's less than 40 degrees C, I'm going to need to have some sort of refrigeration. If I need to go to a temperature more than 250, I'm gonna require some sort of heater. And if I'm even greater than that, 400 degrees or better, I'm gonna require special materials of construction. So there, those are all cautionary things to look out for. And pressure, really my issues are, if I'm less than one atmosphere, I need a vacuum. And if I'm more than 10 atmosphere, I'm gonna need very thick walls, significantly adding to the cost. So let's look at pressure first. If you're gonna operate outside the range of, zero, of one to 10 bar, zero to nine gauge, one to 10 absolute, you need to justify that. Okay, um, generally, if it's a gas process, it's gonna be more economical, right? Molecules are gonna be closer together when the pressure is on the large side, okay? And up to 10 bar is probably not gonna be that big a deal. But if you go much higher pressure than that, then you're gonna need thicker walled equipment and you need to really be concerned about safety. If you go to vacuum less than one bar, you're gonna to have to have special construction techniques, stiffening rings and things to make sure that stuff doesn't suck in. You're gonna usually need larger equipment for the same task, and you have to worry about air leaks and the dangers those might pose. This is a real quick sample of a wall thickness calculation. Now this is, very, very simple. There, it's more complex than this, but this is the basics. And I want you to look at this mostly because I want you to see what variables are involved here. So for thickness in meters, they're doing this based on design pressure, P, the vessel radius, R, the design stress or maximum allowable, allowable working pressure. You learn about that in your safety class, S, E is a weld efficiency, and normally you're gonna get around 90% on that. And then there's a corrosion allowance. And so the authors did these calculations here. And what I want you to see is that as we increase the pressure, right, we are also having to increase the thickness, okay, compared to the corrosion analysis. And that increased thickness is fairly significant. So therefore, working to lower pressures is going to be to our advantage. For temperatures, well, if possible, we'd like to be able to use cooling water to do my cooling. Now, cooling water, generally, we want it to operate between like 30 and 40 degrees C. We'll be talking more about that a little later in the course. And if I'm doing that, it's gonna cost like 38 cents per gigajoule. If I have to go a little cooler and go to refrigerated water, so lower above freezing, that's more like $5 a gigajoule. That's a huge price increase. And if I have to go to even colder temperatures, the price goes up significantly. So if we look here in this, chart we have the temperature of the refrigerant across the bottom and as we go to lower and lower values the relative 
cost of the refrigeration goes up dramatically. So the cost, look at that, to go to negative 50, that's going to be more than 35 times the cost of operating using cooling water. When we're heating, we have similar concerns. And so as long as I'm going up to about 250 degrees C, I can use steam. High pressure steam is uh, roughly 260 degrees C, 600 PSIG. And so that's going to be something I can do. I can't really go to higher pressures to get higher temperatures very easily. Because if you look at this, so the 250 is operating uh, to about here. The steepness here, the increased pressures I'm getting to get to these higher temperatures, just not worth it. So normally we consider that to be an upper limit. If you need anything hotter, you're going to need like molten salt or a dowtherm or a fired heater. And all of those are going to be really expensive. So a decision to heat to more than 260 degrees C, and I really meant 250 degrees C, or to cool to less than 40 degrees C, needs to be justified. Don't just do it and say, eh, it's no big deal. You're going to pay a lot for that. Probably that one decision can turn the project from being profitable to non-profitable. Another concern with temperature is the materials of construction. So in this book, they're going to abbreviate those MOC. So when you see MOC, it's materials of construction. But <clears throat> typically what happens is the higher the temperature, <clears throat> they lose strength, physical strength. And so these graphs here show as we go to higher and higher temperatures that the allowable stress, which is a measure of strength, is fairly constant and then just drops off dramatically. And you see that in case after case for all these materials, that as we go to higher temperatures, we just drop off. Now, this is going to be a problem. Every material is going to have sort of an upper limit of temperature that we can use. Okay? And we need to pay close attention to that. Now, generally, carbon steel is going to be our cheapest option. Stainless will be more expensive. It's better for chemical and thermal resistance, but it costs more money. And if those don't work, I can go to others, say, shown here as the ink alloy or other kinds of specialty materials. But they cost more money. So based on this, a decision to operate at a temperature more than 400 degrees C needs to be justified. There are some other things that you want to be careful of. Uh, for reactors, you're looking for where you're going to get the optimal equilibrium conversion. You also want to look to increase reaction rates to get a smaller reactor. If you have a reaction that only takes place in the gas phase or the liquid phase, then you need to make sure that you are maintaining that phase. Also, we can change temperature and pressure to change our selectivity for multiple reactions. So we want to pay close attention to all of those things. And then in separators, we need to pay attention to whether or not I actually have a vapor phase and a liquid phase for say distillation, etc. If both phases required are not possible in these operating conditions, then there's no point in me trying to design that piece of equipment. We will also be needing to determine whether or not we're going to do a stoichiometric feed to the reactor. Now in reactor design, you've learned a little bit about why you might not want a stoichiometric feed. Normally, that would be the best choice. It's going to be the least wasteful on paper, okay? But sometimes we need to add an inert, okay? Adding an inert can be done for a lot of different reasons. You can do it to control the rate of reaction, 
or to change the equilibrium, change side reactions, help you with temperature control, okay? Many, many reasons why you might add an inert. You also might add excess of a reactant. That's primarily done to change the equilibrium conversion uh, or for inhibiting side reactions that you don't want. Sometimes you may wish to add some of the product to the feed. If you'll remember, there's a certain class of reactions that are auto-catalyzed. And I always remember these as being sourdough bread that you need to have some of the product to get the reaction going or else it's very, very slow to happen. And so when you have an auto-catalyzed reaction, you need to make sure that you're putting a little bit of the feed in at the beginning. But there are other reasons maybe it couldn't totally be separated from the recycle, etc. For compressors, one of our issues that we will need to keep in mind is that we really can't increase the pressure more than threefold in a single stage of a compressor. At that point, it's so hot that we end up with material construction problem. We may have failure. And so typically we'll increase the pressure threefold, we will add a cooler, and then we'll have a second stage of the compressor. And we can do this for as many stages as is necessary. Um, if you have a high temperature coming into a compressor, because compression will increase the temperature, go ahead and cool the gas before you even start the compression. That will save you money also. On heat exchangers, if you have large delta T log mean across your exchanger between the two fluids, more than 100 degrees C in particular, you really want to look at heat integration and we'll look at that later in the course. For process heaters, when the temperature at the exit is less than the temperature of steam, probably using high pressure steam can heat the process stream the most effectively. For valves, we don't want too large a pressure drop across the valve. So in those cases, maybe you wanna put in a turbine to recapture some of that lost work. Okay, and finally, for mixers, if you have streams that have very different temperatures, consider this as an opportunity for heat integration, that we can take some of those temperature changes and use them to drive other processes. Similarly, if you have very different compositions, uh, instead of mixing things before you're then going to separate them, maybe you want to separate the streams separately two smaller distillation towers might in fact be less expensive to operate than one large for the blended streams. And finally, let's look at this process conditions matrix. So the authors recommend this matrix here. All it is is a list of every piece of equipment that you have in the plant and then the various concerns that we might have. And this is something that when you start with your design, as you gather information, add pieces of equipment, going from that process flow or block flow diagram to process flow diagram, think about whether or not any of these issues are going to occur. And if so, research and see if there's another way that perhaps you can do that that might be safer or more economical. So this concludes this video lesson. We'll be looking at examples in class. Thank you very much for your time.